Uh, me personally, I can honestly say that I wouldn't be here without this program. I'm from a small country town in Arkansas with about 10,000 people. This gave me an opportunity to get outside of my comfort zone. Being 40 minutes from Houston, I uh, never thought I would see myself here. I always knew that I would be on a college campus somewhere, uh, but I never thought or even dreamed that I would be uh, in the United States military, particularly the Naval Service. Uh, this has given me a platform to be able to reach back and be a provider amongst my family. Um, I also got to travel and see tons of the world, uh, which is something that a lot of people, they, they really enjoy. Uh, my job as a professor of Naval Science is to develop young men and women mentally, morally, and physically uh, as they get ready to commission into the United States Navy and the Navy uh, and the United States Navy. Here at Prairie View, what makes it special is our midshipmen. And so you think about a unit that now is 50 years old, um, that has produced over 400 young officers in the Navy and Marine Corps, and to date three flag officers, which is a remarkable accomplishment. So Vice Admiral David Brewer III, Rear Admiral Kelvin Dixon, and Rear Admiral O.C. Combs Jr. Tremendous accomplishment to have three flag officers from a unit that early. So what makes this program unique is that we are the first HBCU to establish uh, an ROTC. And with that, I feel that we have a lot of shoes to fill. Um, with those three flag officers, I feel that there could be more. And with our diversity growing, I think that we can accomplish that. It helped to mold officers and and, and we used to say gentlemen, but gentle women and, and, and officers. It, it helped to mold us. Um, it, it gave us, uh, again, skills that we didn't really know about. Um, the product that Prairie View has been able to generate over the past few years since I've graduated and even before then has completely changed the dynamic of what we're producing for the fleet. Um, whenever you go somewhere now, your first ship, like myself, when I reported on board the USS Vandegrift, uh, my weapons officer was a Prairie View graduate. So it's pretty nice to know that they're turning out products that are actually staying in uh, to pursue their military career. And um, I've met so many amazing people that want the same goal as me, and with that I feel it just makes me want to be better as a person and hopefully bring that out of the Navy later in the future. And I can't say what the next 50 years will hold when you think about modern warfare or what will be needed from a military service, but I do know that if we remain committed to ensuring that our midshipmen are able to think critically, to function as a team, to build individual resilience, uh, to take the enormous amount of data that's available to them today and be able to sort through to get to what matters, to be able to problem solve in a complex and ambiguous world, that our Navy and Marine Corps is gonna be in great shape uh, over the next 50 years and beyond. Prairie View A&M University, we've been igniting passion in students for more than 140 years. It's about inspiration. It's about global influence. It's about self-expression and individuality. It's about trailblazing a path of excellence. It's about engaging in the greater community. Above all, it's about helping you realize your dreams. Ignite your passion. Experience Prairie View A&M University. Uh, the Prairie View A&M Naval ROTC program uh, was established in March of 1968. So at that time, uh, during the Vietnam War, um, it was compulsory to be involved in a military program. So Dr. A.I. Thomas, the president of the university, uh, was interested in establishing a Naval ROTC unit to complement the Army ROTC unit that was already on campus. 
Interestingly, at the same time, the Navy was interested in expanding the diversity of the Navy uh, and Marine Corps, and particularly the Officer Corps. And so it was a natural fit, and Prairie View A&M, uh, in March of 1968, became the very first Naval ROTC unit established at a historically black college or university here at Prairie View A&M. Prairie View and the University has always been somewhat of a, a Good morning. The point on the frontiers of change. My name is Terrence uh, Allen. And the Naval ROTC program scientists. was again one of those programs that was implemented I to keep us out on the day two of They knew that the, uh, um, they be Dr. Avenai Thomas and those of you who was here yesterday, I'm sure uh, you had an exhilarating uh, experience in uh, the exchange that we had in the dialogue between the panelists. So what we want to do today, we want to continue that conversation. The, the theme for this uh, forum, uh, juvenile justice, crossroads, uh, treatment, uh, redefining treatment of children, uh, is specific to all of the, the interaction between all of the systems that are involved in taking care of children. Uh, today, we're gonna have what is perhaps the most important component of delivering services to young people. And that is a discussion around juvenile court. Uh, juvenile court is perhaps the most complex uh, system, system of service delivery in American society. It's not only perhaps the most complex, it's also the most misunderstood. Uh, the combination of jurisprudence and, and child welfare is, is something that America has yet to really and truly understand. Um, and so we wanna have a conversation about that, uh, among other things, and we are, we've been given the pleasure of having one of the most distinguished um, uh, authorities in that, that area with us today. So I want to bring um, uh, Associate Director uh, Grady Paris to the stage to introduce our guests. And I have the honor of introducing Judge Ernestine Stewart Gray. Judge Gray was first elected to the New Orleans Parish Juvenile Court on November 6, 1984, where she has served with distinction for 35 years. Judge Gray is the past president of the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, National CASA, the local YWCA, YMCA and Volunteers of American Boards of Directors. She is involved with several national and local legal and judicial organizations where she works to help ensure independent judi judiciary and a court system where litigants receive procedural fairness and justice. Her numerous leadership awards include 2019 inductee into the Louisiana Justice Hall of Fame, 2019 Casey Excellence for Children Leadership Award, 2018 Outstanding Service Award from the Fellows of the American Bar Foundation, 2018 inductee into the National Bar Association's Fred D. Gray Hall of Fame. And I believe that what the judge is most proud of is the fact that she is married to James Austin Gray II, and she is the mother of two wonderful children, Cheryl Gray Evans, who is an attorney and former state senator, and James Austin Gray III, who is an also an attorney and an engineer. Judge Gray. Thank you, and good morning. And you forgot the most important part, I have four grandchildren. <laughs> um, I am so pleased to be here this morning to talk with you about um, something obviously that I've been involved in for a very long time and now it's a real part of my life and something that's really important to me. Um, Terrence talked about the complexity of the juvenile court and the fact that it is a place where we provide services. And I really try to push back on the providing the service part because I really want people to think about providing those services someplace other than the court. Um, really, if we are gonna make a difference in the lives of children and families, we have to push it back further than 
the court door. Um, the services really ought to be provided much early on, much early uh, in the process, and for kids. Um, and it should start really when they're in school, start really when they're at home. But what we recognize is that, uh, what I at least recognize, is that families need supports. And so parents need help in raising their children, and we all have to work together. What I tell people is that we have to get to the belief that the children don't belong just to their parents, they belong to all of us. And as a part of a community, as a part of a state and a nation, uh, it's our responsibility to try to figure out what we can do to raise up children who um, can take on leadership positions, can take care of children who are coming after them. And so that's my challenge for all of us today. So what I want to do is just take a couple of minutes to walk you through a little bit of the history of the juvenile court. Um, before the juvenile court was founded in the late uh, 1890s, children were um, dealt with in adult court. And in adult court, they got the same kind of punishment that adults got. Um, they received, um, you know, kids were put to death for crimes. They were locked up for years in prisons. And so the first kind of thing that happened was many states started um, what they call reform um, institutions um, where they took children out of their community and placed them in what would be like dormitories or um, what they did with the Native Americans, they put them in those schools, right? And so um, recognizing that that wasn't necessarily good for children, in 1899, Jane Adams, along with a couple of other people in Chicago, um, started the first juvenile court in Cook County, Illinois. By the 1920s, um, every state had a juvenile court. Our court was founded in 1909. Um, and so every court has a, had a juvenile court, at, every state had a juvenile court at that time. Um, and what the courts were first based on was this doctrine of parents' patriae, parent, um, the state as parent which meant that the court was empowered to intervene on the behalf of young people uh, who needed help um, based on their life circumstances and delinquent acts. So based on their life circumstances. So who do you think um, came to the attention of the court early on was poor people, uh, immigrants. Um, those are the people who came to the court. And so this helping, sort of helping attitude was early on a part of what the court thought it was supposed to do. Um, the court was to provide rehabilitation and protective supervision for youth. Um, the child was to receive individualized attention from a concerned judge. The hearings and process were informal and the judges exercised broad discretion on how each case was decided. So the judge was the last word. And the judge could basically decide, make any decision in the case that he or she wanted. And largely at that time it was he there were not many women judges in the beginning, right? So this is typical of, of you know, the work that we see in every area that we look at. Uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s, there was a growing concern about the effectiveness of the juvenile court uh, system because the discretion of the judges resulted in varying um, sentences and um, unfairness as people looked at what was going on. So a kid um, could receive um, a sentence from a judge, another kid who did the same thing, or what looked like the same thing, could get a totally different sentence from the judge. And so out of concern for that, there was um, this uh, call for reform. Um, and as a result of the 1960s, the United States Supreme Court made a uh, series of important decisions that brought about the formality of the proceedings in juvenile court. So there was this case um, that um, a young person was charged with making an on, um, obscene phone call to his neighbor's house. The case is Andre Galt, and in that case the Supreme Court said uh, because now the states were in their juvenile courts imposing more serious penalties, they should now give the same rights to juveniles that adults had. So the right to a lawyer, uh, the right to notice of the charges, the privilege against self-incrimination, um, the right not to um, be subjected to double jeopardy, uh, proof of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and a right to confront witnesses. Those were all then afforded to a young person who was in court. That had not been the case before. In the late 1980s, many states passed very punitive laws, including mandatory sentencing and automatic transfer to adult court because of the perception in the country that the juvenile crime was going awry and there was a lot of um, crime at that time 
and people felt that the juvenile justice system was too lenient on the kids. So as a result of this tough on crime philosophy, um, which continued into the 1990s, tougher laws made it easier for kids to be transferred to adult court. Um, children were being confined in uh, increasing numbers for minor offenses. Um, correctional facilities across the country were overcrowded and they were in deplorable conditions. So in the mid 1990s is when we started using the term, how many people are familiar with the term super predator? Maybe not these young people over here, but some people in the back, yes, super predator. That's when we got those terms. And it was in the era, era where gangs were prevalent um, and there was a lot of um, substance abuse by kids. And so there, was a, there were a lot of things going on which people felt that we really needed to be tougher on young people. And the way they thought tougher um, should be seen is that the children should be transferred to adult court. Bear in mind now that when um, the research showed that when children were transferred to adult court, that because they were little and because it was the first time in adult court, many of them got probation, um, which many people felt like they wouldn't have gotten if they had stayed in juvenile court because in juvenile court they had a record. It wasn't their first time. And so they might have gotten a more serious penalty, but because the public and legislators thought that um, the juvenile judges were too lenient and that we really wanted to send this message that if you do the time, if you do the crime, you gotta do the time. And so they started sending loads of kids to adult court. Uh, and so what happened in a lot of those cases when those kids were then transferred to adult court, they were locked up with adults and what they found was that young people committed suicide, they were raped, they were beaten in, in the adult facilities. And so then again, people started saying, well, this is not good for kids, and then we need to look at some, we need to do something differently. Um, in the uh, late 1990s and at the end of the first decade of the 21st, cent uh, 21st century, states were beginning to look at sweeping reform uh, in the juvenile justice system. Um, so today, the juvenile justice system still has rehabilitation as its primary goal, and it distinguishes itself from the adult system in several important ways. Um, delinquency defenses are um, referred, uh, as defined as a commission of a criminal act by a child who's under the age of 18 at the time of the alleged criminal act. And a youth can remain under the supervision of the juvenile court until they are 21. Um, so now part of the reform is that many states are looking at increasing the uh, age of juvenile court jurisdiction. Um, just a, a year, two years ago, we moved our, our jurisdiction up from 17 to 18. Um, we first did it with misdemeanor offenses, and then in Ju July of this year, we're going to be um, um, including um, um, felonies. But a lot of, there are several states around the country who are even looking at moving the court, ju juvenile court jurisdiction to 21. And a lot of the reforms that we've been seeing is, been, is being fueled by the research around adolescent development, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, juvenile court uh, proceedings and hearings are often closed to the public, whereas in adult court, they're open. Anybody can walk in and witness the proceedings. In juvenile court, uh, by and large, they are confidential except in, um, in a lot of states for more serious crime, for the violent crimes, um, the press can come in, the judge can allow the press to come in, and sometimes the other members of the public as well. But by and large, the majority of the cases are still confidential, and so they are not open to the public. Um, that's one of the, uh, one of the other differences between juvenile and criminal court. Um, so I talked about adolescent development. So what we are now seeing is that there is a lot of information coming out about adolescence and the adolescent brain. And what the research really says is that young people don't mature until they're 24, where's, where's the doctor, 26, he kept saying yesterday, 26. Um, that, so we're looking at figuring out how do we deal with that information and really have it factor in what we are doing with young people. Um, and so uh, based on that information, the U.S. Supreme Court has made a couple of sweeping decisions in the last couple of years, which really take us back to where, we st where the juvenile court started. And the juvenile court started on the principle and belief that uh, kids were not just small adults, that they were different, and they needed to be treated differently. 
And the reason for that was because um, they have greater capacity to change and they're less culpable. And so in those recent Supreme Court decisions, that language was again put out as part of what we ought to be considering in juvenile court. And so those last cases that the US Supreme Court decided did things like abolish the death penalty for juveniles, um, got rid of mandatory life without parole for murder, um, and it saw that as a violation of the Eighth Amendment. They eliminated life without parole um, sentences for crimes less than murder. So those are really important things that the US Supreme Court said uh, and gave guidance to the states and to the juvenile courts about what should be happening in juvenile court. Um, and so in those cases, like I said, they took us back to the beginning where the court said, we are making this court, we're establishing this court because we realize that young people are not just little adults. They really are different and we really shouldn't be treating them as little adults. Um, and so what I want to also say is that for the work that we do in juvenile court is more than about delinquency cases. I am um, um, dismayed uh, when people talk about the work that we do, we always focus on the delinquency cases. The other important aspect of the work is the dependency cases, those cases in which um, parents are brought into court or caregivers are brought into court because the children are being neglected or, and, and are abused. And so the juvenile court has responsibility for that. Uh, when I was, um, uh, had been on the bench a couple of years, our court had um, the distinction of being termed by the New York Times as the worst juvenile court in the nation. And what the reason for that related to the way in which we were handling our abuse and neglect cases. And at that time, um, I was really mad about that. <laughs> and I vowed that we were, gonna, we were gonna do something differently. So the judges at that time, there were six judges on the juvenile court bench at that time. And we agreed that what we would do would be to create a specialized division that would deal with the abuse and neglect cases. And so we took two judges of the six. I was one and another colleague who decided we would handle the neglect and abuse cases. So in, since 1999, I've been primarily doing neglect and abuse cases. However, in that time, I also, from time to time, have responsibility for deciding the continued custody hearings, those early, the first hearing that a kid has when they're arrested on a criminal charge. So deciding whether or not they're gonna be detained or not. Um, and from time to time, I do help my colleagues with a trial here and there. So I, I have been keeping my foot in the delinquency work. Um, also, I work um, with the American Bar Association, uh, the criminal justice section, and a couple of their committees where I am working with um, the delinquency side. I co-chair the um, American Bar Association's criminal justice section, juvenile justice committee, and have done that for several years where we are trying to um, educate the whole of the American Bar Association about the issues that are important in juvenile court and how as lawyers who don't necessarily do the work uh, every day, but how they can support the work and help us advocate for what we need for young people and their families in our, in our system. Yesterday we talked a little bit about the connection between dependency and delinquency. I can tell you that there is a large overlap between uh, those cases. So sometimes a kid is in delinquency court first and then he picks, then he becomes a dependent child where the parents can no longer, are, are, are no longer willing to take care of them and they want them to be in foster care. Um, or they are in foster care first, and unfortunately, they then um, pick up a delinquency case. And a lot of times, those delinquency cases result from them being placed in what we call congregate care or a group home where they um, get in conflict with other residents or they get in conflict with the staff. And unfortunately, in my opinion, the, the adults in those situations think the best thing to do is to refer the kid for a um, a delinquency case and I really wish that we did that far less than we do because I don't think we're serving the young people well when we do that. Um, so um, I wanna just talk about a little bit about my philosophy um, in, in juvenile court. Um, so I talked about the article in the 1990s. Um, in December of this year, there was a story in the Washington Post about me and my approach to juvenile court um, and uh, what I said in that uh, summary, short summary of what I said in that article was I thought, when we were talking about abuse and neglect cases, I thought that the court was there for the most severe cases 
that we should not be taking children from their parents unless it's absolutely necessary. Now, I, I haven't talked about this yet, so I want to talk about it. So for me, um, it's important because the majority of the cases that I see are people who look like me, right? And that is a concern for me because I, I don't believe that my people <laughs> are, 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 are bad. I don't believe that they don't love their children. I don't believe that they don't want to take care of them. And so it is a burden. It is um, not a burden. It is a, um, really uh, something that works on my mind every day. And yes, I do have to make those tough decisions. But what I tell people is that one of my responsibilities is to make sure that parents and children get the opportunity to stay together if they absolutely can. And what that means is that I am going to hold the state um, responsible for proving their case, and I'm going to hold the state responsible for providing the services that they identify that the parents and the children need in order to stay together. Uh, one of the big differences between um, delinquency and dependency is that in the dependency area, there are a lot of federal laws which talk about what courts should do. Um, in the delinquency side, there are no such federal laws that say courts ought to be doing these kinds of things. But in the dependency area, there is a lot of guidance about how we should proceed in these foster cases. And so um, what we are told is that um, this, the, la the latest law, the Families First Act, which was passed in 1918, and, and I'm sorry, in 20, 2018, um, was that uh, we should provide preventive services in the home before we take children away from their parents. And that there is a focus on that, and all state agencies have to really show that that's what we're doing. I believe that the law required that before the Families First Act because there was an act earlier that talk, talked about the obligation to make reasonable efforts to not take children away from their parents and to maintain family integrity. And so I think there was, a, there was sufficient basis before the Families First Act, but someone thought we needed another law in order to get it done. So my responsibility, as I said, I, I think my responsibility is to ensure that all of us in the system, no matter whether we're the judge, the lawyer, the social worker, the probation officer, the teacher, whoever, that we are doing everything we can to support the family so that they can stay together. Um, that is one of the things that I believe that children are raised best in families, um, and it's the family's responsibility to take care of them, and so I'm trying to support that. So when a family comes before me in a dependency case, what I say to the family is this. Um, the law says we have about 12 months to work on getting you and your child back together. Um, I commit to do everything I can to make that happen. I commit to hold the social workers and the lawyers accountable for that. But what I need you to do is to commit to work your case plan. And I will tell them if they work their case plan and I am satisfied at, the, at some point that they've done everything and we um, can be assured that the child is going to be safe as, as best we can, then I will give, I will give their children back. But I also tell them on that very first day that if you do not, if you do not comply with your case plan, if you don't change, if you don't correct the problems that we've identified, I cannot and will not give you your child back. And what that means for you is that at some point the law says I have to terminate your parental rights. I don't want to do that, but it's up to you. Um, I will help you where I can, and what I need from you is to you to show me that you um, want your child, that you are willing to make the necessary changes. And if you do that, I promise you will, you'll get your kid back. And so we generally work with parents for about a year. The law says um, if the child has been in foster care 15 out of the last 22 months, the state must file a termination petition. That's what our law says. They must file a termination petition. They can ask for an extension of time to do that if, in fact, the parents have shown uh, a commitment to working their case plan. Um, so some of the questions, and a, a question that I always get is, how, um, how can you, for example, in a case where the parent is, has a serious substance abuse problem, how can you assure that that can happen in 15 months? Well, obviously we can't, but what I tell you, if you remember what I said, if the parent is making commitments, so if they've engaged in services, if they've gone to treatment and are going to their treatment, 
then I will um, allow for an additional period of time for them to successfully complete their case plan so that we can um, reunite the family. Because I believe, like I said, that a child is best raised in, the, in, in their family. And so that's what I really want to do. Um, I've had um, real success in getting, um, so the purpose of the Washington Post article was that in our jurisdiction in Orleans Parish, one, I have very few cases. And two, we are returning children to families and at a much faster rate than anywhere else in the country. And so the question is, how is that happening? And why is that happening? And of course, you know, you always have na naysayers. So some people are saying that um, part of the problem is that the social workers are afraid to call me and ask for permission to take kids. And maybe that's true. Uh, but their fear is based on the fact that I am going to grill them so that I'm sure we actually have, absolutely have to take children from their families. So I'm not just going to say because they went out on a call, they can take people's children away. They have to convince me that that is something that needs to happen, that the child is at risk, the child is not safe, because that's what the law says. I, I believe as a judge... I'm supposed to apply the law, whether we're talking about in the delinquency area or in the dependency area. I am not going to prove the state's case. If the state doesn't prove their case, it falls away. And what I always tell the state, bear in mind, if you don't prove your case, if it's a dependency case, the child is going to go home. If you don't prove your case in a delinquency case, the child's not guilty. I'm not going to be able to order any probation or any of that. So it's on you. I'm, I'm not your... Um, I'm not here to save you. I'm here to call balls and strikes, and if you don't meet the burden, then you don't prevail. Um, so, so I believe that that's what the judge is supposed to do. And when, so when people call me and ask to take custody of children, I'm very dogged <laughs> about making sure that at least I feel like it's absolutely necessary. And so I will tell them that sometimes I'm not going to give you permission to take this child away from their parent. You haven't shown me that the situation warrants that. Um, sometimes I will tell them, well, you need to go back and do this. You need to answer, be able to answer this question and call me back, and, and maybe I'll give you permission to take custody of the children. But it's not an automatic. And so part of what pe some people have said is that um, because I do that, the social workers are afraid to call me. <clears throat> and they perhaps would call other judges and get um, permission from another judge. I do know that, so there are five of us now, and so we rotate that, um, the duty month where the worker calls the judge, and so I do know that sometimes if it's my duty month, they will wait until it's not my duty month and call another judge and may get permission, um, which I think is problematic. It's not good for the system, but I don't know what I can do about that. I'm only, I'm only accountable for myself, and I'm only responsible for when I look in the mirror at night, Am I satisfied that I've done what I think is the right thing to do? I can talk to my colleagues about why I think they ought to be doing something different, but I can't make them do it. I'm, I'm only responsible for myself. And so what I, when I work every day, my goal is to be able to go home at night and put my head on the pillow and say, for this day, I've done the best that I can for the people who came before me, and I've been fair, uh, and I've been impartial with those people. And I've tried to hold everybody else accountable for doing the very same thing. Um, so um, I'm very um, committed to the work. I think it's important. Um, and I try to do every day uh, what I think needs to be done for, for the kids and families who come before me. Um, I'm going to be retiring in December. Um, so a lot of people are talking about what's going to happen when I go. So, uh, so if you heard the conversation about the caseload being down, and it's because I don't let the cases come in, people are worried about when I leave whether or not the caseload is going to skyrocket. Um, I will tell you that um, in, before Katrina, we did have a large um, caseload. I probably had about 300 cases at that time. Um, and a lot of those were cases that I inherited from another judge who, um, who was there. But since Katrina and the population going down, the number of cases being brought to the court has really decreased. 
uh, and we've been able with the lower number of cases to do a couple of things that I really think make a, di make a difference and what I try to advocate to other judges as they're doing the work. So I'm able to see all of my cases every 30 days, which really is not known, not a normal for juvenile court um, co courts around the country. And so when I say that, judges say, well, yeah, you can do that because you only have a few cases. I have hundreds of cases and I can't do that. Well, when I had lots of cases, I still saw them. The law allows us to see cases six months, nine months, and still be in compliance with the law. Um, but what I found when I first started working is that um, social workers in particular, um, if I set a case six months from now, they were not going to do the work until five and a half months from now. And so once I realized that was the case, I said, okay, uh, so we're not going to do the work until you have to come to court, then you'll have to come to court more often. Because I think that uh, it's really important to have frequent connections with the families if we really are, are going to establish the kind of relationships that allow us to work with them. And so I started um, hearing my cases um, first maybe three months, uh, at three months intervals, and then when it got, my caseload got down, I, I really started doing it more often. Um, I do things like, um, that some other judges don't do. I have kids, my kids come to court every time. Um, and so there's this question of whether or not you take them out of court, out of school to come to court. Uh, what I learned from the young people, talking to young people, is that they want to be in court and they want to know what's happening with their cases and why. And so I've made a commitment to always have them in court. Um, I have um, work with our CASA program, Court Appointed Special Advocates, around um, the, in particular, education. Uh, early on, I said, uh, no matter whether the child is going back to their parents or not, one of the things we have to do when we have children in foster care is ensure that they're getting a quality education. And so I'm not interested in um, having kids in foster care uh, and they're not going to school or they're not having the resources in order to do the kind of work that they need to do in schooling. So I hold the department um, accountable for making sure they're enrolled in school, making sure they have all the tools that they need. Because um, I was very clear, if we can't do anything else right, that's a piece that we ought to be able to get right. And so um, working with the young people, I um, established what we called, um, um, I, I bring the young people in um, two or three times a year and where I sit down with them at a table, I'm not in the bench, on the bench, I'm not in my robe, I sit down at a table <clears throat> and I talk to them about, in particular, school and what their goals are. Um, when I first started, and for years, I didn't know a foster child who, had, who went to college. And I said, that should not be. Um, I don't believe that foster children don't have the ability to go to college, and I wanted to change that. And so I started having conversations with young people in court about their education, what they wanted to do, um, what we needed to do in order to support them in their goals, and I would do that two or three times a year. Um, after doing that for several years, we have now gotten nine kids, this year we have nine kids in college, uh, which um, might sound like a small number, but it's more than any place else in the state, and it's more than I had ever had before. And I think that what it, it is important because it says to people that if you support the young people, if you have expectations for them, then they can do it. They can do, which we know they can do as well as anybody else in school. It's just that we don't expect. We somehow think that because they're in foster care, they somehow don't have the ability to do the work that other our young people are doing. And so I spend a lot of time um, talking to young people about my expectation of what I want for them, and hopefully they want the same thing. And I say to them the same thing I say to their parents. I mean, if you want something, let me know what it is, and I'm going to try to help you get it, because I think that's, that's my role. That's the concerned judge that I talked about earlier. Um, it's not just about um, whether or not, to me, it's not just about the issue of guilt or innocence. It's not just about whether or not the parents actually committed abuse and neglect. It's all of that. It's the whole child. And so my role, I, I think, is to pay attention to the whole child, their, their desires, their needs, and their wants. And so whatever I can do to try to make sure that um, those things are being met is what I want to do. Um, and so what I would say is that um, 
for me, uh, no matter what kind of case it is, um, uh, we need to keep it out of court. Um, I'm very clear that the fewer cases we have in court, the better. Somebody said yesterday they wanted to work themselves out of a job. I said that too early on, um, and I still think that's an important goal. It probably will not happen anywhere, but with that attitude, it will mean that we don't recklessly just bring kids in to the system, that we think very clearly about why they're there and making sure that they need to be there. And so for me, it's only the most serious cases that need to come to the court, whether we're talking about a delinquency case or dependency case. I will say to um, the district attorney who actually prosecutes both dependency and delinquency cases in, in our court, uh, but on a delinquency case, you know, I, I remember um, the children being charged with stealing a sandwich. And I would say to the DA, why, why do we have this? Why are you using your resources on stealing a sandwich case when you have on the other side, you might have uh, a murder, you might have an armed robbery? Those two cases don't deserve the same attention, right? So we need to figure out how to deal. Why is the kid stealing a sandwich? Because they're hungry? We need to figure that out. And that case doesn't belong here. And so don't bring it to me unless you want me to make you dismiss it. Um, and so, you know, I have issues with the DAs too because they think I'm not reasonable. Uh, but that's okay. Um, so I see it as my role to inform uh, all of the stakeholders about uh, what is best what I, what is best for children and it's not uh, we know the research shows that uh, having children detained is not good um, it disconnects them to their family to their community to their school and those things interrupt that interrupts normal development and so unless we absolutely have to we shouldn't do it because the consequences are really dire. And I think what happens is people don't really think about the consequences of what we're doing. We assume that um, the, the best thing is to address the issue and take them out of um, the community and that everything is going to be fine after that. And it just is not. Um, um, doctor, the doctor talked yesterday about ACEs um, and, tr and what those are, are adverse childhood experiences. And an adverse childhood experience is being put in the juvenile justice system. Um, and that impacts that uh, that's traumatic and we are adding trauma onto trauma and so we need to figure out how to, s to stop that. Um, so what I want people to remember is that uh, when a child has contact with the system it um, interrupts adolescent development like I said and what we also know is that the more contact that the child has with the court system the less likely they will do well as adults. So what we are, what should be trying to do when we intervene is our intervention should be trying to produce uh, productive adults. And if what we are doing is not giving us that result, then we need to change what we're doing and figure out how to do something else. Um, according to Terry Moffitt, um, detention replaces the positive nurturing influences of school, community, and family with an adversarial punitive system that both engender hatred for authority and apprentice children to crime under the tutelage of more hardened criminals. Um, so if we don't want to build more criminals, we shouldn't have them detained. Um, and we should keep children with their families if at all possible. Um, and so what I tell people is, from my perspective, from what I've seen, youth involved in, the juvenile, in juvenile court, dependent or delinquent, need the same things that any teen needs to become a healthy adult. A dream, an adult who believes in them. Um, at this point, I'm not sure that we need to redefine the juvenile justice system. We just need to make one work that we have. Um, and I think there are adequate um, tools and resources that we uh, can put in place to make the system work. Um, I am I'm always hesitant to say, let's pass another law because what happens is we pass a law to deal with one little particular thing or incident that happened, and usually it is a knee-jerk reaction, and it's not, it doesn't give us the comprehensive view of what we need in a law. So I, I think we have sufficient laws. We just need to all commit to um, believing in the children and the families and making sure that they have what they need in order to be um, productive adults. Um, Gabriel Mistral says, many things we need can wait. The child cannot. 
Now is the time his bones are being formed, his mind developed. To him, we cannot say tomorrow. His name is today. And that's the urgency about our work. It's today for them. It's not tomorrow. Thank you. All right. So I'm supposed to take questions? Yes. How many? About one fifth of the kids who come to court. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I, um, I would say I'm an anomaly. Um, oh, he, okay. Oh, they want you to use the mic. It's being recorded. Not that you're. Not that I can't hear you. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I think I said earlier, I think, um, for example, so kids going to school hungry, that may be true, but there are programs that, you know, kids can get food at school. Um, there are programs that provide uh, food for after-school programs. I think that one of the things that happens is people who are running those programs don't know how to take advantage of that. And I'm not excusing uh, parents, because I do think parents have a responsibility. But what I will also say uh, if you remember what I said at the beginning, the kids don't just belong to their families. And so even though parents may not be doing what they ought to do, what they can do, we can't sit back and say, I'm not going to make sure the child has what they need because the parents aren't doing what they, what they should do. And so I think uh, people owning, taking ownership of kids in the community belonging to them and making sure that they are getting what they need is what, what really needs to happen. Uh, so you know that Canizero is probably running for re-election for a DA, right? <laughs> he, no, he, I think he's running. He might not get elected, but he's running. <laughs> yes, anybody else? Thank you, Judge Gray. Uh, we have stu two former students who graduated last year from the doctoral program, and their focus was dual status youth and the foster care system. One of the students did a qualitative dissertation speaking to former dual status youth, and one of the findings was that a number of the uh, former wards perceive that juvenile justice personnel were instrumental in them getting on a positive trajectory and they had a very negative perception of child welfare. So my question is, what do we need to do with child welfare? Uh, that's a, that's a, a, low, a big question. So I, I can talk to a little bit about the experience in um, New Orleans. So part of um, yesterday in one of the questions, there was a conversation about pay, teacher pay. So social workers are, not that that should be the answer, but we need to um, lift up the work, uh, social work, right? So social workers are paid uh, poor salaries, right? We need to say that this is important work. We need to put our money where our mouth is. So in New Orleans, for example, while I have um, a low c court caseload, the workers have a really high caseload. Um, so there are cases that don't come to court that they are responsible for working. And so we need to have more caseworkers. 
Um, I think we do need to do a better job of training the, the caseworkers so there's the formal education that they get, uh, but the application in the field um, is different. So, you know, I remember telling people about going to law school, and what I say is that law school taught me nothing about being a lawyer. Uh, didn't give me any skills that I could translate to the courtroom. I had to learn that somewhere else. And so for social workers, they get the, the learning from the books, but the actual application of it is different, and so they need to be able to walk alongside of someone who's already done the work, knows how to do it, and so they need to be mentored by um, a social worker that's been in the field for a while. I think those, and, and the continuing education, I think is important. So we know that, for example, the dynamics of families coming into child welfare change, right? So, you know, there's, um, uh, several years ago it was crack cocaine, now it's the opioids, and we really have to stay on top of all of that, which means that in addition to doing the work, we have to afford the opportunity to, for them to get the necessary training to be able to, to deal with that. And so training and more workers and better salaries, I think. Yes? Oh, she's, <laughs> anybody else? Or you all have to come on because I have um, until 12 o'clock. <laughs> can, you, can you speak just a little more about dual status kids and how they may be treated differently in the court system or by the case managers? So uh, so the dual status kids, those are kids who have a dependency case and a delinquency case. And so I think the big problem is for most um, jurisdictions, uh, they have two workers. They have a probation officer and a social worker. Um, and when you have um, two people supervising, you are likely to get uh, inconsistent approaches, right? And so what um, a lot of jurisdictions have done is they've created this specialized docket uh, for um, dual status kids, and so they have one worker, either a probation officer or a social worker. Um, and I think that paying attention, um, having a judge who is responsible for those cases uh, is important as well. We know that the models that really work well for um, a lot of the kids in juvenile court are ones that have the young people come to court uh, more often and the judge is really engaged in the work with the young person. So, so there are, you know, I already talked about having kids be out of school and unfortunately for most juvenile courts, the hours of juvenile court are, you know, 8.30 to 4 or 5. And so there's no night court where we could have the young people come at a time when they're not in school. But, but the research shows, for example, that the drug court model uh, is really successful for young people um, where the judge is seeing those children, you know, sometimes once a week, sometimes twice a month, whatever the child needs. And so um, having frequent contact with the court and the judge and having the kid understand that there is really somebody walking alongside of them that can help them with issues as they come up. Um, I think what we really need to be able to do is um, get rid of some of the silos. So it's not just a social worker, it's not just a probation officer, but it's all of us together on this team working for the benefit of the young person who's before us. He doesn't want to be recorded. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you know that since uh, previous mayor Mitch Landry, when he did uh, uh, try to help to do reduce the crime in New Orleans, one was uh, one of the things he did. He did an agreement with the cliques, certain number of to do instead of gangs, because you know New Orleans don't have a gangs. You know the most of the cliques that people who just basically try to increase the crime rate of it. So when he did come up with the idea to just communicate with these people, build a group of people who can, you know, get along with each other to reduce the crime, because the most of the cliques that who are hanging around with the big cliques, the elderly, those are the younger ones who try to look for a parents or the, you know, family union, you know, community things. So do you think that I, I know the new mayor, Ms. Cantrell, what he's trying to do, she be open a new facility on sober facility who people try to get really help from the you know alcohol related issue 
Do you think this kind of programs needs to be more open for the New Orleans to help to those young kids who really need help? Um, I, I would say the answer to that is yes. I don't think we, uh, I, so I um, travel a lot. I uh, talk to judges around the country um, and we exchange ideas. I don't think there's any place where any judge believes that they have all the resources that they need to help families. And so um, I think there needs to be more of those programs. What I will say though, is that part of my concern is that when we create programs, one of the things, that, so programs are created, somebody gets a grant, and they get a grant to do a certain kind of work, and then the grant goes away, and so then they're left with no one. Or they have a contract with the state to do a certain amount of work, and the contracts just get automatically renewed without anybody ever saying, well, wait a minute, is this an effective program? And so the evaluation of effectiveness of the programs that we have or are using, I think is critically important. And we've got to be comfortable with um, evaluating those programs and saying at some point, well, you said your program could do these things. When I look at the results of your program, it's not doing that. that this is what I need. And your program is not getting me what I need. So I'm not going to give you another contract. And that is really something that we are hesitant to do. But I think it's absolutely necessary in fairness to the kids and the families that we're serving and in fairness to those of us in the system. If we find something is not working, we shouldn't keep using it because that's not helping us. I'm going to talk a little bit kind of off topic but not off topic. I'm going to suggest that maybe part of the problem you said the juvenile justice system is supposed to be rehabilitative. And I work with probation officers in the state of Texas. Last year, I was asked to go work with them because the probation officers themselves have a punitive, they have a punitive focus. They, okay, the, the idea was to get them to understand it's <laughs> supposed to be rehabilitative and not punitive. Um, and this is obviously, okay, how about that one? And the problem was, and, and the younger probation officers were more willing to buy into rehabilitative, but some of these had never been a parent. They didn't know what a nurturing parental kind of mentoring, um, they didn't know how to do that. Some of the older probation officers literally sat back like this and said, I've been doing this 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, and those kids, blah, 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 blah. So I think the courts do what they can. They, you are bound by rules and laws that say, kid messed up, he has to go into this system. It's a sad thing, but, but the system is supposed to be helpful and rehabilitative. And yet, we are hiring people, they don't get paid a lot, they have long hours, they don't have someone that says, here's how to be nurturing, here's how to be a mentor. Instead it's, get them on the wall, lock them up, if they act out, put them over here for time out for a while. And so I think the problem is bigger. I don't think it's just this court system. Well, I, I would agree, but so the court system is made up the juvenile justice system, I'm sorry, is made up of not just the judges, the judge, the probation officer, the social, social worker, the lawyers, both those who represent the parents and the children and the state. It's all of those people. It's the researchers, it's the uh, you know, education. It's part of the system, right? And so part of, I think, what needs to happen is, I, when I said it doesn't need redesigning or reforming, but I do think there needs to be a change in attitude and like we really need to go back to and figure out what being rehabilitative means. And that, um, you know, we have to, just like we have to evaluate programs and when they're not effective, don't use them anymore. Um, just because someone was a probation officer five years ago or 10 years ago, doesn't mean that they need to be a probation officer in the day's world. And if the day, today's world requires a different mentality which they can't get on board with, then we're doing a disservice to everybody. And we really shouldn't do that. And so, I don't know, are you unionized here? Are the probation officers unionized? No, no. well, so, um, 
I'm not sure what that means. They're what? Oh, no, well, not just Texas. Uh, uh, okay. So, well, because if you had a union, that presents some other difficulties, right? But also what doesn't happen in, um, I think, in these departments is that we don't use the tools that will allow us to say, you're no longer effective, and therefore, we're not going to maintain you on our payroll. So evaluations uh, of the work that's being done and feedback from a supervisor um, saying, you know, this is what we need you to do, and if you're not going to do that, if you can't get on board, then you need to find another job. So firing people is something that needs to happen too. Yes. You, me you mentioned that uh, you don't think there needs to be any huge changes because there's, but I think that when we're changing the way a person thinks, it could be implemented in training. Should training change the way we're training probation officers or other professionals dealing with the juveniles? If they are trained to deal with them in a way that's more effective, you may see an attitude change too. So it's sort of the culture, and a culture creates sort of a perception. So I, there's value in looking at what the training is showing and telling them how to interact with this population. Oh, I, I agree. I'm, 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 yeah, I would agree with that. So yeah, looking at, you know, that I think is important. I would agree with that. I, I, I'm saying I don't think that we ne necessarily need to have law, more laws, but I do think that we have to, we need to change attitudes. And um, that's what I really think needs to happen rather than a, another law, another provision on the co in the code. Yes, sir. I mean, since we, I will say, I don't want to put anybody, since I know the criminal justice system racially biased, so how do you think we can minimize this bias? So um, I think that um, I would first answer by saying that it all begins with the person who's got to make the decision, right? So we know that everybody has biases. And we all agree with that. Everybody has biases. Yes. Even African Americans, right? Yes. So, you know, when I look at, uh, we talk about the system, at least I I where I am, the majority of the kids who come to court are African American. The majority of families who are losing their children to the system are African American. By the same token, the majority of the workforce in child welfare and probation are African American. Um, we have in Orleans right now, the majority of the judges are African-American. Wasn't always the case, but now the majority of Afri are African-American. Um, and so just having African-Americans is not solving the problem because we, we, we have been, uh, as a group, we've been indoctrinated. We've learned how to not like ourselves. <laughs> uh, and so that plays out. But what I say is that everybody's got to examine their own biases. And um, I use the example of when I first started, um, so I've gone through a transition. I think I've become a better judge uh, uh, over the years. But when I first started, one of my reactions was, um, so I was doing um, child support cases in which, by and large, fathers were being brought into court for not taking care of their children. And I would sit there and I found myself, uh, in many of the cases, getting angry. Because what I said was, my father worked three jobs in order to ensure that we had what we needed. If my father could work three jobs, these young men can get a job and take care of their children. I was getting angry. That's, that's my, that was my bias. And so what I use that example to say is that when we know that's happening, when we feel we know it's happening, we have to figure out how to let that go and how to not let it influence our decisions. And that was just one of the ways in which I saw, um, we all bring to the work our, our life experiences. There's no way we can forget it, right? And in some instances, that, that is a good thing. Uh, but it's not always a good thing. And so we have to make sure that we are always taking steps to try to minimize whatever our biases are. And everybody's got them. 
um, you know, in the child welfare side, you know, workers will come in and say the house is dirty. I'm like, what does that mean? The house is dirty. And if it is dirty, how is that posing a safety risk to the child, right? And I will say, this is a 16-year-old child, and the house is dirty, and they can clean it up, right? We don't need to take that child into care for a dirty house. I mean, even for a baby, you know, there are some things that you can do that minimize that. But so we have to figure out how we um, minimize the biases that we have. Um, I, I've been known to tell workers that, you know, we don't get involved with families in order to make them middle class, right? Because one, as a country, we don't want to pay for that, right? Uh, but what we are involved with them is to minimize the risk to the children. And as soon as we do that, um, then the children go home. Um, I have <laughs> said that, you know, I'm not, I asked the social workers to show me where there's research that says children need to have a separate bedroom. There's no research out there that says that. But yet we hold that up as a standard for getting kids back to their family. If they don't have a separate bedroom, if they don't have a dresser, uh, that's, I, I don't know how that's a safety risk. And so I fight those kinds of things because I don't think that children ought to be separated for that. I don't think children ought to be separated from their parents because, you know, they don't have a refrigerator or there's not food because there are ways to get that. And our responsibility is to try to figure out how to empower families with the ability to get what they need. So we help them by showing them where the services are. We help them by engaging them to services so that we actually get out of, our li out of their lives. The state is a horrible parent, right? The state is not a good parent. Uh, even for um, those cases in which we take children and put them in foster care and they may get adopted, we haven't done what we needed to do in order to ensure that those young people are developing health, healthily. So it's a, it's a bad substitute parent, and unless we really have to have it as a substitute parent, we, shouldn't, we should do something else. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Judge. Um, I'm uh, Seisha Katanini. I'm a faculty member in Justice Studies. Um, I've been doing research for almost 30 years. Um, I've been here for five years and prior to that from Illinois. Um, Illinois State has been very progressive in developing various policies. They even passed a legislation um, where 18-year-olds can be considered as juveniles as long as they are misdemeanor offenses. So the judge that was responsible, like to, uh, to some extent influential, in bringing a lot of changes, her name is Judge uh, Elizabeth Robb. Um, she was a circuit court judge. She brought many, many changes in the state. Um, so, but she relied on research. I was one of the consultants. Um, so any issue she had, she said, we need to hire a researcher to find out what are the issues before we make any changes? So how much research influenced policies and practice in juvenile justice? Well, so there are a couple of issues. Um, unfortunately, in my opinion, there's not a lot of money that's going to research for in juvenile justice, right? Not a lot, uh, some. And so it's hard to get, um, research done on a, a lot of issues um, in, in juvenile court. Um, not, I'm pro probably because there's this concern about confidentiality and all of that. So it's hard to really get research going. But I, but I think it's clearly needed. And what I say is part of the problem is that we're not using the research that's out there. So there's research that talk, I already talked about this, for example, how harmful detention is, yet we still send thousands and thousands of kids to detention, even though the research says that's bad. Um, and so what I advocate is for the research that we do have, let's use it. Um, for the research, for example, that the Supreme Court used in those cases to say life without parole is not right, the death penalty is not good for kids, use the brain science to support the work that, that we're doing in the field. And I, I encourage people to do that. I, I, I was trying to think of how I could get a research project for the center here. <laughs> So I'm gonna, I will work on that. <laughs> All right, so we have a new group of people coming in. I don't know how we're gonna um, bring them up to speed. I need to worry about that. 
So do y'all know what we're talking about? Okay, these are college students, right? I, even high school students. I don't, do you all know what we're talking about? No, over here, those who came in late. I mean, not late, but after we started. No? Okay, so we're talking about the juvenile court. Anybody know anything about juvenile court? No? Yes, they have to do criminal research. Okay. So um, we're talking about juvenile court and the need for reform of the court system. And so juvenile court handles cases involving children. Oh, I'm sorry. Juvenile court um, handles cases involving children generally um, up to 18, um, in some jurisdictions, 16, um, but generally, by and large, 18. And they also handle uh, abuse and neglect cases where parents are brought into court for abusing and or neglecting their children. And so we're talking about how the court might need to change in order to better serve those children. So we've talked about things like uh, implicit bias, um, you know, the philosophy of the court, the philosophy of the juvenile court was one that said um, juvenile uh, kids are different from adults, and so they shouldn't be treated like adults. So they are less culpable, and they're more capable of being uh, reformed. And so the work that we in juvenile, do in juvenile court ought to keep those principles in mind as we're working with young people. Um, so basically, that's what we've talked about. So now it's question and answer, and if I'll go back over here for questions and think about what you might want to ask about that. Was that a good synopsis? Perfect. Okay. Any more questions over here? Oh, uh, in the middle? Not a question. I want to make a comment. If yes. We, <laughs> I work for a JP court, and we're the truancy courts. And when we hold a family or a child in contempt, then we refer them to juvenile court. I don't see what the purpose of doing that is. And we have a real problem with it because when we do it, we talk to those probation officers, those juvenile probation officers, and they say to us, we don't have time to deal with this case. My caseload is already too heavy. And so I, I don't know what we can do, but you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's, it just doesn't make sense to keep doing that. This is something that we've got to look at, like you said, and figure out there needs to be maybe another kind of, of uh, higher justice that we need to refer these children to. Sometimes, more importantly, it's just to work with that family and that child longer. Right. And that's, we don't always have the time to do that, to try to help them. But truancy, um, we feel like should not be in this category, but that's what we're required to do in Texas. So we, we, we in, in Orleans Parish, in the state of Louisiana, we have to deal with truancy as well. And so what happens in uh, Orleans is that we have a court, municipal court, that deals with the parents. And the children come to juvenile court. That, it's not a better solution <laughs> because you have the municipal judge telling the parent to do one thing. You have the juvenile court judge saying to the kid to do something different. Now, mm -hmm. we've talked uh, for years about how to bring those two together. So mm -hmm. to me, it makes sense for either the municipal court to have the parent and the child or for juvenile court to have the parent and the child. Mm -hmm. And actually, we could have them in juvenile court if the DA would foul it in juvenile court, but they want them to go to municipal court. So I don't, yeah, we have the same problem in trying to coordinate that. Um, and really, you're right. Truancy is not an issue that ought to be in court anyway. It should it's be a, somewhere it's an educational mm -hmm. issue. It ought to be dealt with by the schools. We, we're working on it. We have a real progressive judge, and so we actually got involved in the decriminalization issue here in judge? Texas. Where's that progressive judge? Where is she? <laughs> She's back here. <laughs> <laughs> She's turning around. She's very progressive. I, I can say this about her because I'm real proud of it. She was one of the few judges who had the courage to go down to that legislature and stand there and say to them, yes, we need to decriminalize truancy. Right. Children should not be criminalized for failure to attend school. But the whole thing with parents is still another issue. Parents' cases are still criminal. Those uh, uh, contributing cases, parents right, contributing right. to the child's not attending, and, and, and that's not always the best thing. Sometimes it just keeps parents from coming to us, period, because they're saying, if we just show up, you know, we're going to get in trouble get in so trouble. we don't even show up for, right. for court. And that's, it's just a real issue. The, uh, let me just say this, too, about the whole thing. Caseloads, the number of clients that a, a caseworker, my poor juvenile case manager right now probably has 90 kids on her caseload, and families. 
that we, we all have to pitch in and help her. It's, we've got to do something because that just is not workable. You cannot give the best of yourself when you've got that much pressure on you to deal with those numbers. And so it's a real issue for us. Thank you, though, for your good work. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. So yeah, I talked about the fact that we've got to do something about the caseloads. Uh, if, we, if we really want different results, we've got to, that is something that we really do have to change. Um, the caseloads being high doesn't really help any, anyone. It's a disservice to everybody. Um, Yes, Judge? <laughs> well, since, um, since my senior planner has called me out, <laughs> I, I guess I'll come forward. I'm, a, I'm Yvonne Williams. I'm Justice of Peace over in Precinct 1 in Travis County. And thank you, Judge Gray, for being here and all your wonderful work. Uh, one of the things, and I mentioned this yesterday, I wonder, uh, your, the, the children you're seeing are going into the, the, the criminal justice system. They're being incarcerated, et cetera. Uh, the ones I'm seeing <coughs> are sometimes there's a, probably about a 15% crossover because some of them are also in the juvenile justice system and, and there's any number of reasons why they're not going to school. I'm seeing them because they're not going to school. They're truant. But most of them need resources. Now, my, my question is, uh, do you have any observations on just what children are getting? So we know there's a reason uh, like I have this, um, this, there's this blank look that a uh, gentleman mentioned not too long ago that says, I'm depressed. So just, just clinically, just terribly depressed. That's why I don't get up and go to school in the morning. That's why my mother can't make me go to school in the morning. So we're going to put you in a treatment program to do that. But most of these folks do need some sort of treatment, some kind of counseling, some kind of guidance, call it what you want. Uh, are, how do you make sure people get access to that, especially when you have a, another group of people who think only in terms of being punitive? We got to punish them. They're hardheads. They're knuckleheads. I had to stop a man, uh, a truancy officer, from calling them knuckleheads right in front of the kids, right in front of me. Well, he's just a knucklehead. That's why he doesn't go to school, and we don't know what we're going to do with him, and so we just have to keep, we just have to keep filing on him. I don't know what we're going to do with him. He's just a knucklehead. I said, would you please just stop calling the child knucklehead uh, in, my, in my court, please? So you have that group there. They're punitive. we got to punish people. And then we have folks and we have scientists that recognize people really do need assistance. There's something going on here. Let's make the connection. Families really do have some dysfunctionalism going on, don't we all, to some extent? Uh, so how do we deal with that? How much help do you think the children that you're running into is getting while they're incarcerated or even if they're out? And, and what's your thought process on that whole paradigm? On what, what do we do? How do we help folks? So for the kids who are incarcerated, um, so we've worked really hard on keeping our detention numbers down and keeping the stay in detention short. So that poses one a, a problem with getting services while they're in detention because they're not going to be there that long. And so it's hard to get them engaged. And unfortunately for our community, um, the number of services that are available in, the com in their community, in their community, um, are small. And so for New Orleans is a big city. Um, most of the services are in one area of the city. And most of my clients, most of the children I'm dealing with are coming from somewhere else. And so you have transportation issues and getting them to services. You have um, the services are being provided by and large with, by people who don't look like them, who, you know, I, I do believe there is something in uh, some positiveness in having services provided by people who look like them, understand the culture, and can relate to, in some ways to what's going on with the family. So um, there is a disconnect for that. We, uh, we also have now in New Orleans a high uh, Hispanic population and many of the services don't have people who speak Spanish. So that's a whole nother um, problem that we're having to deal with. But I would say by and large, um, there, is, there are not enough services. And um, even for the services that we do have, the hurdles in getting to the services for families are tremendous. And so what we really need to do is create those services in the neighborhoods uh, where the children are coming from, where the parents live, and in the schools where they are uh, uh, attending. That's, I think, what we really need to do. Yes. 
Uh, hi, Judge. I had a question with um, children with like uh, brain deformities with um, going going with abuse because abuse over time can lead to deficiencies in the brain. Um, even if they don't have the physical uh, injuries such as like a broken bone or a broken leg or something like that that you can physically see um, during MRIs and testing and stuff when the brain deficits are shown. If that child is to commit a crime and go into the juvenile system, the juvenile uh, court system, what is being done for those children who are experiencing that brain disorder? And apart from a mental illness and um, their specific intent, intent, but if they have no, if there's nothing there up here, then how do those children go about getting treatment? Um, also, who pays for that? And is there anything being done about um, those children, that small minority, which is could pro possibly be larger than what I know. So um, for those young people, they're represented by a lawyer. In many of those cases, they raise competency to stand trial uh, because of what you're talking about. And so um, if they are deemed incompetent, they are placed in a restoration program which in which we work to try to restore them. Uh, but for many of them, restoration is, is not possible. So they will be in a restoration program in it for a period of time. And then the, the um, staff working with them will say at some point, I don't believe that this child can ever be restored such that they can stand trial. And so the condition for standing trial is that they have the ability to help their lawyer um, prepare a defense. They, have, they know right from wrong. And so if we can't ever establish that, then the child doesn't um, ever go to trial. And so for them, they may spend... Um, years in a facility um, because they can't uh, be released because they still pose a threat to the community. And so they may be in a facility for, for a very long time uh, for the rest of their lives. But the process is to have a uh, what we call a sanity commission, which would be three doctors to do an evaluation and make a recommendation to the court about whether or not the child can uh, be restored and stand trial. And if they cannot, we don't try them. Yes, um, <coughs> Mr. Allen. In, in my opening remarks, I mentioned the complexities uh, of juvenile court, and specifically juvenile court judges. And much of what we've heard, many of these comments stem directly to what I believe is the most, the most challenging uh, aspect of being a juvenile court judge, and that is blending jurisprudence with child welfare and trying to do what's in the best interest of the child while at the same time, you know, following the law. And how, how is, I mean, and, and I could be wrong, but I think that's the greatest challenge of a juvenile court judge and what uh, distinguishes him or her from criminal court judge. How do you feel about that and, and how have you managed that during the course of your career? So I talked earlier about, first of all, um, so I take an oath to uphold the law, right? And so I believe that's my charge. But upholding the law doesn't mean that um, I can't take into consideration what's in the best interest of the child, right? Um, in fact, in juvenile court, that's what we're supposed to consider. Um, so weighing on what the judge um, should be doing, is so the judge's responsibility is to uh, adhere to the law um, respond to what's appropriate and in the best interest of the child, but they are, there's also protecting the community, um, protecting the citizens from the kid. Uh, we have to do that as well. And so in my process, um, I first start by saying, um, since it's a court and there's a burden of proof, the first hurdle is for the state to prove their case. If they don't prove their case, I don't really have to get to the best interest, right? It's only I have to do that if they've now convinced me that the child has con um, con committed a delinquent act, and then I need to, so to decide what happens as a result of that finding. But if they're found not guilty, I don't have to do best interest. So my first hurdle is to ensure, and I think uh, this helps kids too when I say, if you don't meet your burden, state, this case goes away. So that's what I think is the first thing that I, I should do in order to make sure I'm looking at the child's best interest. 
holding them to the standard that the law says they're supposed to meet. Then once they meet it, then I can do other things to really decide about best interest. I can talk to the probation officer. I can talk to the, um, the social worker. I can get um, evaluations. I can have a doctor evaluate the child to help me come up with, for this particular case, what would be the best thing to do for this child. And um, so that's sort of how I, how I see my, my role and what I'm supposed to do. I first adhere to the law, make them prove their case. If I don't prove it, no best interest question. Best interest I only have to deal with if they approve their case and they are saying by proving their case that this child is gonna be in the system. This child is gonna be on my caseload. Otherwise, I don't, I don't get there. Yes, ma'am. Um, hello, I don't mean to backtrack, but I meant to get up, but somebody got up before me. And you That's were okay. talking about the restorative programs for the children, and you said um, something about the children not being able to be restored. Could you expand on not that? Not being able to what? Restore. Restoration? Yeah. Oh, okay. So in, in order to, when I was talking about, to his question about standing trial, so in order to, for a child to stand trial, um, the court, the judge has to be convinced that the child has the ability to understand the process, right. to help their lawyer prepare a defense. Um, and um, if the child at a certain, at the point we're looking initially, can't do that, what we are required to do is have a specialist work with the child to get them to a place where they do understand the process. They can help their lawyer. They can talk to the lawyer about what happened. They can say who might have been present, who might be a witness. So we're using um, techniques to help the child develop the ability to help the lawyer and the ability to know right from wrong. So that's the restoration part. Yes. Techniques like basically coaching the child through it. Is that what you mean by techniques? I'm sorry, what? When you say techniques, are you do you mean like coaching the child through it? Or mm. what, what kind of techniques are y'all using? <laughs> well, uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily say coaching, but but um, explaining over and over the process, mm -hmm. um, helping the child through using examples. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, so if this happens, this happens. Do you what do you think should happen? Is this right or is this wrong? Do you know the difference between telling the truth and a lie? So you you can work with young people ar around that, and so the. Um, Clinicians that we use have um, been taught um, skills and techniques to use. I, I don't know what they are because I don't do it, but right. the skills and techniques to use in order to help young people get to a point where they can help their lawyer. Yes. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Um, has the, I, I wasn't here, and um, you probably already mentioned this, but has the program already um, taken effect? Which program? The one for restoring the, the youth. Oh, yeah, so by law, oh yeah, it's been in place for a long time. It's not a, it's not a new program, it's been in place for a long time. I mean, even in the adult system, um, if someone is charged with a crime in the adult system and they allege, they plead not guilty by reason of insanity, um, we have to stop the process and go through the process of getting them to the point where they can do what I said, help the lawyer um, with their case, understand right from wrong, um, and, and all of that. And so it's not a new thing. It's been in existence for a long time. And it's something that's in the adult system as well as the juvenile system. Okay. I think I have a follow-up question, but I'm going to think about it first. Okay. So I just wanted to kind of talk to the two students. I'm also a student doc student, but I've actually uh, worked in the uh, forensic units at the San Antonio State Hospital where we do the training for uh, understanding the four pleas, competency evaluations. And so it is a process. The people that are being trained, these people, we are psychologists, we are therapists, so they're very well trained. They have groups. They, they're treated very well. So I don't want you guys to think that, oh my God, you know, they're just thrown anywhere. No, they're very well taken care of. They're very well taken care of. And they have various hospitals in the state of Texas that do this type of uh, restoration. In Louisiana, too, and they, and have a, um, they have a group of doctors who really are holding themselves out as 
being able to help young people. And so the courts know who the doctors are. And so when we appoint a sanity commission, we usually uh, appoint three doctors who will evaluate the child. And so the, do the court, the judges are aware of who those people are and who really are producing the evaluations that the judges have confidence in. So some people evaluate and we look at it and go, well, ooh, wow, I don't know. I won't use that person again. Uh, but there, there are some doctors who are very good and the judges use them over and over. Yes. Um, I first wanted to say thank you for expanding on the, the psychologists and psychiatrists who take their time and uh, work with these young children. But I wanted to ask, and these are kind of a two-part question, um, if nothing is being done at the moment, what could be done or what is already in place for the doctors and psychiatrists, uh, forensic therapists, uh, the counselors who are, um, who pre in court, they present their report um, saying that this child is competent, if they are or not, how much weight does that hold? Um, also, while in those, those hospitals, um, away from, uh, kind of exiled from society, um, how much freedom does that specialist, as you, as you said, or the counselor or the therapist, the, whoever is working with those children, have to work in that work with that, with that child? Um, if the program is in place, yes, but if the program is only in the hospital and is not effectively teaching um, and showing and giving this child hands-on experience with the outside world to, re to successfully re reintegrate back into society, to restore um, any type of relationship, then what could be done to um, give more freedom with safety uh, regulations um, for the child, the specialist, and society as a whole? So, so bear in mind at the process we're, we're talking about restoration here, it's not, the, the, the decision has been made that the child poses a threat to him or herself and to society. So the child is not, the consideration for release is not an issue. We've decided that for everybody's safety, the child is not going to be out. So that's not the restoration we're talking about. It is restoration so that they can get to the point of standing tr for trial, right? And so within the facility, the um, therapists and the counselors, so yeah, they're the ones who are doing the work with trying to restore them in terms of getting them able to understand the process. This is what it's all about, understand the process, uh, being able to help their lawyer. That's all we're trying to get them to be able to do at that point. The restoration in terms of being restored to their community is at a later point. This is not it. Um, and there was, there was, what was the other part of your question? <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> um, it was, um, the first one was how much weight does that hold? Oh. So, um, and then I think you just answered that. Um, but how much freedom does that specialist with understanding the process in reality, in, in synopsis that this child is never going to get out um, of this facility or this hospital, then it's, it seems kind of ironic that there was a, there would be a program in the first place to restore someone back into society when they're not ever going to be back into society. Mm. So again, it's not the the issue here is not restoring them back to society. It is it is their ability to stand trial. The the um, so if the uh, evaluators conclude that the child um, is not going to be able to help their lawyer not going to be able to understand the process, um, that still doesn't get rid of the decision that the judge made early on that the child poses a risk to him or herself or the larger community. And if that's the decision that's been made, the fact that they can't be restored is not going to get them released, right? So they continue to work with them to see if, so they, they weren't restored at this point. The law says the therapist, the psychologists, the psychiatrists work with them for another period of time, and we keep coming back to see if the child has been restored. So it's not a one time um, they're restored or not. It's a continuous process. Now, it will come to a point. Uh, it may come to a point where we decide that the child is not going to be restored. But again, the determination of the danger to himself or herself and the community is still there, and they're not going to be released. Okay, and, and um, the weight that's given to the evaluation um, by the um, psych guys and the therapists, um, 
well, quite a bit of weight is given to that because as a judge, right, I don't know the, um, what they know in terms of the psychiatry and all of that, and so I'm really dependent on an expert to make a recommendation to me. Now, if the recommendation seems really off base, I don't have to follow it. But generally, um, we do three doctors so that you don't have the possibility of having a tie, right? So you have two, will, two or one, right? And so um, usually you will go with the recommendation that's made by two of the three people is what judges generally do. Um, the second part to that question was how much freedom do the specialists have while working with the child in, in those facilities? So pretty much it's their call on what the, um, so how many times they see the child, for how long, all of that is determined by them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, my question is kind of like when they are inside the detention center, um, do they go through the psychological tests that is needed for them, to, for the psychologist to be able to know like any problems that they are facing? And then I have a follow-up question to that. So, um, yes, um, they are evaluated and those, the, the results of those evaluations come to the judge at the disposition, which is sentencing if you're in adult court. So the, they may be evaluated when they go into detention. They don't come to trial for 45 days, 60 days. The judge doesn't see that until after a determination is made about guilt or innocence uh, because we don't um, want the judge to, judge's decision to be prejudiced by those evaluations. So they might get evaluated, but the judge doesn't see them until much later. Um, and usually all of the kids who are detained are evaluated. Um, every child who's arrested is not detained. Um, some of them are released. Um, after they go through intake, they're released. Only the more serious charges are the kids detained. And if they're detained on serious charges, they're going to get an evaluation. Okay. Um, I don't, oh, that's in New Orleans. In Houston, um, my brother was detained and put into detention, but in around 2017. Um, he spent from October to about Christmas in there, but he didn't go through no psychological testing. It wasn't until this December that he um, that his school paid for a psychologist for them to figure out that he had ADHD and depressive disorder. So it's kind of like, you know, he spent a, a large period, well, a small period, but a large period of his time in the des detention center. So it's like, you know, we thought that the, he was going through these proper tests in the psychological places, but he wasn't. And kind of like um, his ADHD played into a factor of why he was detained. So um, do you feel as though there would be more, like, will the family be able to get the diagnosis afterwards or get, like, be aware of what treatment that their, um, their family member went through because my brother didn't really get any of that information? So, um, when the, so when the children are evacuated, so first of all, the children are represented by, in our court by a lawyer. Every child has a lawyer. And the evaluations are shared with their lawyer um, who, so there's this, um, tension because the lawyer represents the children he doesn't he or she they don't represent the parent and so many lawyers feel that representing the children they're not necessarily required to share that information with the parent because it's their client's information uh, but we generally try to have uh, the parents know what the results of the evaluations are so because if there is a recommendation for services the parents the family needs to be aware of that so that they can be supportive. What we know is that uh, when we have children in the system, if we're gonna give services, we need to have the family involved in all of that. The child can't do it by him or herself, so we need the family involved. And the only way you're gonna get them involved is to share the information with them. But I would ask you, um, before he was arrested in October, you said? Um, yeah, that? in October. In October, what was happening at school? Um, that's the reason he got arrested at school. It wasn't a fighting or anything. No, um, no, no. I'm, I'm just wondering. <laughs> seems like a missed opportunity. Yeah. For he should have been evaluated at school, mm -hmm. right? So that is a prime example of why I'm saying so much of what gets put to the juvenile court is inappropriate, pushed to the juvenile court is inappropriate. He should have been evaluated in school. 
and he should have been receiving services in school so that, so that he didn't get to the point of the school having to recommend that he be arrested and taken to juvenile detention. Okay, so you're stating that the high school, our high school should have provided us the psychological ooh, treatment beforehand. I, I'm thinking that he probably was doing, coming to the attention of some teachers doing some things at mm -mm, school, no? None at all, huh. none at all. Mm, <laughs> that's that's right. Okay. Yeah, that's like his like compared to a lot of people that he met in the jail, like his the reason why he was arrested was um, very minor, very, very, very minor. It was just like our it was just a, it was an act of very racism that occurred at our school while my brother was um, tackled and arrested and then spent a long period of time like October to December. It's like every time we kept going on to trial, it was like, oh, you know, he's going to be released. He's going to be released while people are in there for more severe acts. And his was very minor. But it was just the um, when my family found out that he was like his ADHD explained why some of the behaviors that he experienced at home. It wasn't a lot that had to do with the school, if that makes any sense. So, but there were some things going on at home. Yeah. So an opportunity for uh, to address it before it got to court. So that's that's also one of the things that that happens. So um, for us as African Americans, we um, are reluctant to address uh, issues in our family, particularly if we think there might have a mental health component to it. Um, and so what I was suggesting that somewhere before he got arrested at school. There was an opportunity for people to intervene. And you know, one of the ways would have been through the school, even if his behavior was at home, because the school, um, you know, if your parents went to the school and said, I want my child evaluated, we're having these issues, I want my child evaluated, I mean, they can do evaluations at school too. Okay. So yeah. Thank you. Sure. Hello. Hi. Okay. So I we came in a little late. I apologize if I'm repeating a question. It's okay. Um, but I heard a lot of people speaking about restoration once a youth or an adolescent has reached, um, unfortunately, the position of having to face you in court and where to go on. So. F um, Furthermore, from that point, my concern mostly lies with um, instead of focusing so much on restoration once they've kind of reached that threshold into the justice system, what steps are being taken to provide intervention for them to kind of decrease that um, school to pipeline or prison to pipeline, I'm sorry, school to prison pipeline phenomena that takes place and is yet still very much so um, real and active today, especially in the state of Texas. That's my first question. And my second part of that is, um, I heard you mentioning to the lady before me about there being an intervention or maybe some type of missed opportunity for her brother while he was in school. And my question in regards to that is, from a statistical basis, and I got this information from the National System for State Courts, it might be a little bit outdated, but I believe it's no later than about 2008 to 2016, um, only 28% of public schools actually hire a licensed, and I say licensed, a licensed mental health professional. So, and out of that 28% of those licensed individuals, only 18% of children in Texas actually receive, those who are eligible, I'm speaking in regards to, only 18% of eligible youth actually receive the mental health that they're eligible for. So that's the second part of my question. And after that, um, I did want to ask what is being done by the justice system and what collaboration is happening between the justice system and the academic system and the education boards and things of that nature to kind of bridge that gap and making sure that instead of focusing so much on what are we going to do once they get here, what can we do for them while they are still in school, um, maybe not so much as just saying that it was a more so of a missed opportunity to counsel because sometimes it's not always that black and white. Okay, that's so there's three questions in there. Let's <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first one was, um, what, what are we doing to try to prevent, right, uh, So before they come to court? So um, in the beginning, I talked about the fact that for me, that's where we need to focus our attention on prevention, and that means providing services and making sure that people know about services in the community, in the school, other places in the community where they can get help. Um, I believe in primary prevention. Primary prevention is before, before they touch the court, before they touch the system. 
and there are lots of opportunities to um, provide primary prevention, and the school is one, right? Um, and so on the prison, school to prison pipeline, there are a lot of jurisdictions who are working out cooperative agreements between the court and the school and the police and the DA's office where they are saying, um, for the children in our school, we are committing to not making referrals to juvenile court. We are not going to send children to juvenile court for these kinds of offenses. So they have uh, a team of people who sat down and talked about uh, looking at what kinds of offenses were being referred from the school to court um, and what was being done with those cases. I mean, so a lot of times the cases just sit, right? And so um, after looking at the data that they had, they decided that the best thing to do was not to make the referral, was to figure out how to provide the services in the school. And so they outlined a process. So if a kid got into trouble, um, there is a, a manner in which that comes to the attention of the school and then they provide the services in the school without making a referral. So a lot of jurisdictions are, are doing that. Um, so that was one and two, right? What was the third one? <laughs> um, uh, what was the last one? Um, Somebody help. Myself. What was the last one? Um, no, the school to prison pipeline, they just did. I, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I, I should have for, written I it down. <laughs> Um, I forgot my third question, but I'll make this the third question. <laughs> yes, about licensed professionals oh, and oh. students who are actually eligible to receive the certain services and what are we doing more to kind of ensure that they're actually receiving those accommodations to make sure that they're being successful. But um, I kind of wanted to piggyback before you answer that really quickly to what you said about um, there being intervention happening in the school. So. I've kind of read up on this from a, I'm, my major is psychology, so from a more of a statistical perspective, I haven't, and of course I'm just a student, I, I'm not behind those curtains, I haven't really seen much change as far as how the school board is, statistics will also show you that the more chances or the more disciplinary actions taken against a child, the higher their chances are of dropping out of school, which creates that school to prison pipeline. Literally beds and jails are being built based off of tests and standardized testing grades, right? Which is crazy because third graders are failing exams and they don't even know they have a cell waiting on them um, right. because that's the expectation that's being set. I also believe that insanity is doing something repeatedly and expecting a different outcome. Yes. So shouldn't there be a change maybe in kind of the justice system and the academic system first and foremost and how we are discipline, disciplining students versus sending them to the office, suspending them, creating kind of removing that negative stigma of having police officers in the school because there's not really a healthy correlation there between police enforcement and children and youth and adolescents. So I'm only saying that to say, is there anything or is there something that maybe I have not researched or read up on that's being done within the actual justice system itself to maybe refocus their structure and how they're applying those systems and practices in collaboration with the academic department? So I can't speak to what's happening in Texas, right? <clears throat> I don't know whether, whether somebody behind me can't speak to that. Uh, behind you, she's gonna speak to it. Um, but I, I will say that um, most of what I talk about, so the things that I've talked about are happening on small, in small scales, in uh, one little community in a state, it's not statewide, because one of the things, one of the um, difficulties with the juvenile justice area is that, well, a difficulty, I don't know whether it is or not, but it, as opposed to child welfare, and there are uniform um, laws in child welfare that every state has to look at. That's not true in the delinquency area. So every state is free to do whatever they want in the delinquency area. Um, and so you have um, a lot of jurisdictions who are doing different things. All I can talk about are some things that I know that some friends of mine in other courts, other states are doing. And so um, the working with the cooperative agreements, for example, in Atlanta, um, a judge um, there has worked with the school system. These are models mm -hmm. that I'm talking about that other people can look at and use to see whether or not they will work for them. And so um, the, a memorandum of understanding with the school board and the court and the police and the district attorney about, okay, together we've decided this is the way we're gonna handle school issues, school discipline issues, and we're not gonna make referrals to court. 
Um, I did some work with the American Bar Association where we were looking at what you talked about, the police officers in the schools, and we actually recommended that um, school districts not hire police officers because uh, what we know is if you look for something, you're going to find it. And so having police on the campus meant that more violations were being found and referred. And so we actually recommend that schools don't have the police officers on their school grounds. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, and some folks, we have a class break, so that's why people are leaving. Uh, really quickly, se uh, Texas is very proud of the fact that in 2019, they passed a bill requiring license, more licensed mental health workers in school. No, the reason for it is not per what people have expressed here today. The reason for it is in Texas is to prevent mass violence, uh, school shootings, because Texas believes that we should have guns. So to balance it out, there is now a law requiring more licensed mental health workers in school. But I want to say something really quickly. Um, one of the problems why more people aren't screened, it's very expensive. I did not know until recently that a proper screening costs about $1,200, psychologists. Mm -hmm. And uh, students, in case you know people who need that sort of help, right now on the first floor in the psychology clinic, we're doing that for how much, Ms. Stearns? We're doing it for how much? $10. We're doing it for ten dollars. It's one thousand two hundred, but we're doing it for ten dollars. That's temporary relief, a steal of a deal. In case you know people who need it, we're doing it for ten dollars right now. And how long are you going? How long are you going to be doing it? Uh, you mean for ten dollars? <laughs> yes. I don't know, but right now we're doing it for ten dollars. When Dean Gibson agreed to that, she didn't know that the real price was one thousand two hundred. <laughs> But we're doing it for ten dollars, right? Now. Okay. People should okay. take advantage of that because it's really enhanced. Okay. Um, I was just gonna ask, what are the profile of the kind of cases that you see? Um, uh, for delinquency, most of the <laughs> most of the cases we're seeing right now are um, theft of cars. Um, we have some carjackings, um, but really uh, breaking into cars and stealing the cars and going and driving till the gas runs out and then ditching them. Um, so joyriding, we're seeing a lot of that. Um, some cars are being stolen and parts are being taken to um, sell to make money. But um, the most of our cases are, are, are those and it involves both boys and girls um, who are stealing the cars. A couple of years ago, it was, so in the 80s, it was the same thing, your car thefts. Then that died down, and now it's back again. And it's really a huge problem in, in New Orleans. Hi. Hi. So um, I guess I probably missed this question, and you probably have already answered it, but I wasn't here. But um, so how far is the scope of the program, like, I know you talk about that it does, you know, extend to the hospitals and things like that, but does it go outside of the hospital? You know, is this just something that's just in the hospital or is there anywhere else? So when you're saying the scope of the program, you mean the one where I'm talking about the restoration for the Sanity Commission? Yes, ma'am. So yeah, they're really working with the children in the hospital for that category of cases and for that issue to be addressed. There really are are in the hospital with the kids. So have you ever thought about taking it outside of that? It's not up to me. It's the law, right? So if the kid is um, deemed to be um, incapable of standing trial, the law says that they must be restored. And the restoration for that, the child who is a danger to himself or someone else, has to take place while they are confined. Right? So that's where it is. So um, even in the, you know, the, the system and, and things like that, um, I guess my question was more, and I apologize if I asked it wrong. That's okay. But my question was really more geared towards those that are maybe 
in the system, you know, in the prison, and they're going to be released and things like that. Okay. Have you ever thought about, you know, reinventing it that way as well instead of just confining it to... So for kids who are um, committed to um, the juvenile justice center, so they're spending a year, or six months, two years, or whatever in the juvenile justice system detained uh, or committed, um, they are, the juvenile justice system and the department is required to work with the young people to get them ready to go back home. So the law provides that within so many months of their return, uh, well, actually, first of all, the law says when they are committed, uh, the department is supposed to develop a plan for their re safe reentry into their community. And so while they're detained, they are working on the issues that need to be addressed in order for them to be safely reintegrated. So, but within six months of their release, this is a more concerted effort. So they have to do things like ensure that the child is ready to be re-enrolled in school, which is a big issue for uh, a lot of kids who are detained. When they are, deta when they are committed, the school systems don't really want to let them back in. And so we really have to fight um, to get the kids back in school. And so working um, to get them reengaged in school, to connect them with services that they may need, like drug treatment or mental health services, um, the department is required to start working on that and make the connections for the kid and his or her family before they actually get returned home. So yeah, they, we, we work on that before they actually go home and while they are detained. So um, I kind of took a class on this last semester. Oh, you're trying to trick me. And no, ma'am. <laughs> no, nothing. No, ma'am. Um, Just joking. Okay. I kind of took a class on this last semester and um, I, I kind of just saw, I don't know like the exact statistics of it or, or the specifics, but I do know that um, sometimes I guess it's a little bit more harder and trickier to do those things, just depending on like who exactly is um, looking after them. And I guess I wanted to know like, um, who are the people that are helping them to be able to be integrated back into that, you know, and are they trained, you know? Um, what exactly are they learning? Um, you know, is it, you know, I mean, and this is probably a common question, but you know, are the people just there, you know, just to, because it's a job or, you know, how often are they getting integrated back into society? So the people who are doing the work for us are the probation officers. So we have mm -hmm. probation officers who work with the young people who are, being, who are returning. Um, and so they, they are the probation officers. And for our state, the probation officer is someone who graduated from college, has a BS in any, almost any field. Um, but many of them have uh, a degree in uh, criminal justice. Um, and so it's, it is a job. And so just like with any job, you bring people, different people bring different commitment um, and uh, to their job. And so you have people who will go all out to make sure that the kid gets what they need and some people who are gonna just do the bare minimum. minimum. But it requires both the probation officer and the schools um, to work together in order for that child to be reintegrated into the school. And it's a different question uh, uh, in terms of you know, reintegration into the family. So what, one of the things I say is, uh, if we do our, the way we do our job is that we take the kid remove the kid from the family and the community, we work with the kid, we give the kids all, all these skills, we build them up, but we haven't done anything with the family. So the child goes back to the family and now they really are a different human being, right? They're different. And so they get many times rejected by their family who said, oh, now you, you think you're better than us and we don't really, so we don't work well with the families enough to, for that to happen. Uh, we really should be working with the family more than just before we are getting the child back home. Um, the family should be getting skills and understanding what the child is being taught and how the child is being developed to be a different person than the person who left them when they were committed. And so doing a better job of that, I think, is something we have to do. <clears throat> so I, this is going to be my last question. I okay, because there's somebody behind you. I know. I'm so sorry <laughs> about that. Come on, go ahead. Okay. No, that's okay. Okay, so um, I know you pointed out that, um, you know, it would be more helpful if you guys work with the families as well. And so are you looking into something like that? Because 
I mean, me personally, like I've gone, I've, I'm currently in a, a situation like that with my family as well. Maybe not so much as a situation, but um, I'm currently kind of going through something like that. And so to the extent of where, you know, would you be able to provide those services? And have you thought of, you know, maybe instead of having probation officers, no, you know, no, I'm not talking down on the probation, probation officer him, themselves, but maybe have you thought about, you know, recruiting or hiring maybe people that would be a little bit more experienced and, and things like that. Um, just from you know, taking those classes and learning, you know, what the reality and the scope of probation officers are and even having professors that have actually been in that position as well and seeing, you know, my perspective. Okay, so a little bit about, <clears throat> about my system. So I don't have probation officers. I don't hire okay. probation officers. It's not my decision who gets hired. Uh, in my court. There are other courts that do have probation as a part of their court system, and so they have more control over who the probation officers are. I don't have that. So probation is run by a different department than mine, and so I don't have any say over what the requirements are or any of that, who gets hired or any of that. What I do have is the ability to say to them uh, in a case what I think ought to happen and what my expectations are. Uh, but I don't have the ability to hire probation officers or to hire somebody else for that matter. Um, I, I just make orders, <laughs> order people to do things and make recommendations, but I don't have the staff. I wish I did have a probation uh, uh, office as a part of the court because clearly then I would have more control over what they did, but I don't have that. Thank you so much. You're quite welcome. Good morning, Judge. Um, real quick question. I'm sorry. So um, I'm not from Texas. I'm actually from the Midwest. Um, what to, state? Uh, Idaho. Idaho. Yes, ma'am. Um, we actually made it mandatory a little while ago, about in 2015, to have every sophomore in high school take a psych valve up until they graduate. So I take was, a psych evaluation? Yes, ma'am. And they made it, uh, they're passing in state law about 2015, 2016. The question is down here in Texas, I, I, and, and Louisiana as well, like why haven't y'all kind of done it? Well, um, well, so here's another side of me. <clears throat> um, I am not one who advocates for those evaluations across the board. Mm -hmm. Um, I am concerned about labeling our children as whatever, deficits here or there. Um, for me, <laughs> um, I find that we're too quick to have our children um, categorized as ADHD, conduct disorder, that, all of those letters. Mm -hmm. I try to resist that. Because once that label is attached, it doesn't go away. And it sends a message to everybody else who's dealing with that kid already that you know, the kid has got something wrong with them. So I, I don't advocate. And when people ask me to order evaluations, they really have to explain to me why we think that's necessary. Um, I, I, I just don't like evaluations. And the part of the problem is, by and large, the people who are doing the evaluations don't look like me. They don't understand my experiences, mm -hmm. and I think that makes a difference. So I, 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 push, I would push back on that. I would not. Okay. I would rather see the money that would be spent on mandatory evaluations being spent, spent somewhere else, because I, I don't know what we get with that. Well, yeah. I was going to say, their, their reasoning was the well, reason why they said it was because they were afraid of the rise of, like, school violence, basically, something that she was saying. So that was their reasoning behind right, it. Right, yeah, but I'm, I'm not so sure that even that is a sufficient justification. So that's, that's what I talk about. So we have, for lack of a better word, knee-jerk reactions mm -hmm. to situations, and we do things that really don't make sense, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, they get the evaluation. What's going to happen with the evaluation on all those kids, right? They're going to look at them and say, okay, this is a kid that we have to watch that may be a shooter. Mm -hmm. um, probably a lot of the kids who did those shootings, they wouldn't have shown up that way in the evaluation anyway. Anyways, yeah. So it 
it really is not, a, in my opinion, a good use of resources. You would be better off um, figuring out how to provide um, other kinds of services to, to the kids, not, not the evaluation. Thank you. You're welcome. Before this closes, um, I just wanted to, I don't know if it's really a question, it's more of just, I wanna hear what your opinion is. Um, I know that he was just saying that wherever, he, the state that he's from, that they pretty much test everyone in mandatory, mandatory basis for you know the health of their mental state. Um, I'm considered a um, ward of the state of Texas. And upon becoming a ward of the state of Texas, I had to go undergo a psychiatric evaluation just because that's the procedure whenever you, your parent loses custody of you. Um, and I heard, I say that to say that only under those circumstances was I required to take, not due to anything that I had done, but just because that's a part of the system. And then two, um, you mentioned a couple times about the collaboration with involving the parents and, you know, kind of, administering help to a child. Um, I think that might just be a little bit ob too objective um, because not every child who isn't a ward of the state comes from a background where their parents unfortunately want to help in bettering their child. So aside from that's an ideal way to look at it. Of course, us all, we want we figure, even some of like my peers are like, well, where are the parents at? But some people aren't really familiar or um, I'm gonna say optimistic in realizing that not everybody is fortunate enough to have parents who want to be a part and play a part in helping their child, whatever the case may be, foster child, adopted or not. So unfortunately, that responsibility does lie on the state and the education system. Um, I think that there's the lack of disrespect towards psychology across the board in science and in the justice field and in the education system needs to be totally removed because um, I know that there's these different programs that you're mentioning that you definitely promote, but until there is an effort to kind of Par what basically what I'm trying to say is parent or not, children at a young age need to be instilled with the appropriate mental tools to stabilize their cognitive abilities and to stabilize their perception in regards to sensation. And that should, that should be concrete, regardless of them having a parent in their lives or not. And that should really have an effect on the overall outcome, you know, because there's a lot of people out here who come from well-to-do backgrounds who don't have it. There's a lot of people who don't. Um, who do just fine. So um, I guess that was more of a statement. <laughs> I enjoyed listening to you. I wish we actually found out about this a lot sooner, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Judge Gray will be available to meet with students at 2.30 in the administrative conference room if they have an interest in juvenile law and uh, pursuing uh, these, this kind of work in their career. So she's going to be informally meeting with students again at 2.30 at if you're around. Uh, also at this time, can Susan Brady? Yeah, I want you guys to join me on this stage. And also, I want to acknowledge a few people as we walk to the stage. Um, I know Professor Rembrandt is in the room, and uh, Kathleenie, Dr. Kathleenie has left, but I want to thank her, uh, Professor Rembrandt, um, who else, um, Dr. Gibson, uh, for bringing students here to enjoy this uh, or take part in, in, in this activity. Uh, it's the end of a two-day forum, uh, and we did our very best to enlighten you on what we believe is an important issue, and that is you know, the whole notion of juvenile justice. People often think about juvenile justice in the context of delinquency. And they, when they make reference to juvenile justice, the first thing that comes to mind is locking children up. 
So we really wanted to emphasize that juvenile justice is a lot more than just locking children up. There's a lot more complex, there's a lot more work and time that go into making decisions that are relevant to the well-being of young people. So we really wanted to take two days and invite people who have an expressed interest in the work, uh, who have a tremendous amount of expertise. If you were here yesterday, uh, you witnessed uh, some of the leading experts in the state of Texas and indeed uh, throughout the nation. Uh, and of course, uh, Judge Gray was part of yesterday's activities as well. So we want to thank everybody involved in that process and I especially want uh, to acknowledge uh, the communications and marketing department here and, and in particular uh, this gentleman taking these pictures. Uh, uh, Michael Douglas who uh, I, I'm, I, I can say without question, uh, without him, uh, this would be different. <laughs> to, say, to say the least, it, it would be different. Uh, he's responsible for all of this and, and a lot more. So um, I want to, and also the staff in the Juvenile Crime Prevention Center, uh, Dr. Broadus, and uh, where's Aaronette? She's not here. Aaronette Watson West, she's <laughs> somewhere working. Uh, so uh, without, without them, uh, again, it, it would be, I, I don't even want to try to describe how, <laughs> how this would have happened. But, um, Michael oh yeah, Michael Hampton. Hmm. Yeah, that's the, uh, I don't know the, the acronym, but the department that's responsible for setting up this. So we, we're, we're very appreciative to that. I mean, we have a small staff, and this was a lot of work uh, for four people. So we needed the support and resources of, 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 the, um, of the university. And uh, lucky for us, people took a specific interest in helping us. So we are very thankful and grateful. At, at this time, though, I want to I want to um, present this slight token of our appreciation to Judge Gray. She mentioned that she was retiring. I wasn't <laughs> going to mention it, uh, although I knew I wasn't going to mention it. But um, I've known Judge Gray for approximately 10 years. Uh, and I, 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 I'm a part of the a small part of an organization that uh, she is a big part of. And uh, about 10, maybe 12 years ago, I, I went, to, I just joined this organization and I started going to these conferences. And part of the organization, there is um, a group of, man, I forget that committee, uh, but it's, it's primarily, the, the organization is primarily lawyers and judges. And I'm a researcher, but it was in the area of my work. and. If you're a juvenile justice researcher with a background in social work, it's difficult to find a place to fit where you're comfortable uh, that's in line with, with your work. So the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges was an organization that I felt comfortable and I felt that I was in line with the work and the interests of, of the people. And one thing about <coughs> judges, I'm gonna get back to this in a minute. But one thing about judges, if you're a researcher, you have to speak a different language, right? In other words, you can't go in a room and start talking all this research stuff because judges want you to speak plain and simple <laughs> so that they can understand. So they don't, they don't want you to come in and speak above their head. You have to <laughs> somehow find a way to speak somehow. to them instead of at them. And so, I noticed during the course of the time the people that I was sort of linked with, primarily African American judges, uh, they all looked to one judge. They all had a certain amount of respect. And, <clears throat> man, this is weird. 
they had a certain amount of respect for Judge Gray. And at some point, I was able to have conversations with her, and then I realized why. And when she indicated to me last year that she was going to retire, I had to figure out a way to get her here. Uh, because when people retire, they change, <laughs> you know. Uh, right. They do what? <laughs> Uh, and so she and I was telling her about the center and I was telling her about the work that we were trying to do. And she said, well, why haven't I ever heard of that place? And I said, okay, that's a good, that's a good sign. And so I, I went and I spoke to our director, associate director, and, and explained to them. And we made it happen. And so now she's here and I hope she enjoyed it. I did. I did. It's been great. Yeah. So now... We're going to, ooh. <laughs> you broke it already? Yeah. So we, so we got a little. It just, it just kind of pops in. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm sight challenged, but. Uh, yeah, you, you probably should read it. Cause I don't want to Honorable Ernestine Gray, judge of the Orleans Parish in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thank you for sharing your time, wisdom, and experience as keynote 13th Annual Roythless Forum and Lecture Series. <laughs> we talked about that earlier. Can I, I think we yeah, okay. Thank you, Tony. Well, that will conclude the 13th Annual Royce West Forum. We appreciate your time and attendance, and we especially appreciate the fact that you stayed to the end. Prairie View A&M University, we've been igniting passion in students for more than 140 years. It's about inspiration. It's about global influence. It's about self-expression and individuality. It's about trailblazing a path of excellence.